Wilson Development Review Board for December 14th, 2021. Uh, I'm Kim Kelly, Chair of the DRB. Welcome to the applicants and the public participants. Uh, please sign in if you're doing this by Zoom. Please sign in renaming yourself on the participant toolbar so that we know who you are and if you're going to use the chat function uh, helps facilitate that. Uh, this is a hybrid meeting taking place in the police station meeting room and virtually on Zoom. All members of the board and the public can communicate in real time. Planning staff will provide Zoom instructions for public participation before the hearings are open. All votes taken in the meeting that are not unanimous will be done by roll call in accordance with the law. If Zoom crashes, the meeting will be continued to January 11th, 2022. Let's start by taking a roll call attendance of DRB members participating in the meeting. Uh, Paul Christensen. Present. John Hemmelgarn. Present. Scott Riley. Present. <coughs> David Saladino. He is not, I think he's away tonight, so he's not here. David Turner. Okay. So we have five present. Uh, and uh, so we do have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Emily, why don't you walk us through the uh, Zoom instructions, please. Oh, Simon. Okay, um, everyone, welcome to this hybrid meeting. Um, uh, as the chair said, please take a moment uh, to rename yourself uh, if you're on Zoom, you can do that using the by clicking the participant participants button uh, on your toolbar, and then clicking rename um, in the uh, top corner. Um, if you are here in the room with us uh, and you are using a laptop or a mobile to stream the Zoom meeting, please make sure you keep the microphone, camera, and speaker off to avoid any interference. Uh, for those of you on Zoom. Uh, the toolbar to Zoom has a number of features. Uh, in the bottom left corner is the mute button, and that controls your mic. Uh, it allows you to mute or unmute yourself. Uh, you also have the stop video button. Uh, video is optional. You can have it on or off. Uh, the center button is for chat. Uh, you can use that to message me. Uh, I'm Simon Miles. If you have any technical issues, and I'll see whether I can help. Uh, we also have the reactions button. Uh, that has a raise hand feature, which you can use during public testimony to indicate that you'd like to speak. Uh, alternatively, you can just message me in the chat uh, if you'd like to speak. Uh, and lastly, if you are on the telephone, uh, you can use star nine to raise your hand or star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, we will be using screen share this evening. Um, it should default automatically to the side by side mode for you. Uh, which is what we recommend viewing. However, if, uh, if it's not, you can access it by clicking the new option on the R sharing, uh, clicking the side-by-side -side mode, uh, and then you can use the central um, slider there um, to uh, adjust the size of the uh, screen share and the video. Uh, and lastly, if you are having a, a bad internet connection, uh, there's a number of things you can try. You can try turning off your video. Uh, you can try closing browser tabs, shutting down computer programs or closing phone apps. Uh, or you can try using your telephone as a speaker. Uh, and you do that by clicking the small up arrow next to the mute button, uh, clicking where it says the computer audio, uh, and then dialing in via Zoom uh, using the meet meeting ID, which you can obtain from our website. Thank you, Simon. 
Okay, the sequence of events tonight is a little bit different. That's because the last time the DRB met, it was November 23rd, and uh, we did not deliberate that evening. We came back for a separate, separate deliberation session. Uh, so tonight we are going to uh, read the uh, motions and recommendations from that meeting. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I would like a motion to approve the minutes of the November 23rd, 2021 meeting. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Scott. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you, John. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, yay or nay, please. Paul Christensen. Yay. John Hemelgarn. Yay. Uh, the chair is a yay. Scott Riley. Yay. Uh, and Dave, Dave Turner, you can you can vote if you have watched uh, the video of that hearing. Have you watched the video of that hearing? I, I did watch the video. Okay. Uh, yay or nay? Yay. Thank you. Five in favor, none opposed. The meetings are approved. Okay, next up, um, I would like a motion for DP 22-01, which is a pre-app for the Trinity Baptist Church. Uh, is there a DRB member um, who would like to read that motion? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to read it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, bear with me, bear with me one second. Do we have so it's so we have the changes up on the screen, correct? Yes, we do. Yeah. yeah. You have that document that was circulated by email. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or would I, you I, like to have something got, going to, to the motion? Well, I've got the document that came in my packet. Let's, uh, Pete, let's just cover, let's just cover this, and make sure we're, uh, I'm on the right page here. Okay. The motion's on, the motion's on page four of the, uh, um, of the document that I have. Actually, there's a modification to on page five. Are we reading both of them? Actually, Scott, there's the, the first motion is on the top of page three for 2201. <clears throat> as opposed to 2202. And I, and I, folks, I'm at a disadvantage. The, uh, I never did get a packet. So I, I what you're looking at, I don't have. Oh, I got so Pete, it. Are, you're looking for, you're looking for a um, motion on 2201. Is that correct? I'm looking for a motion on 2201. It's the, um, it's the, it should be consistent with the amendments that we made that yep. were circulated to the DRB. Okay, yep, I, okay, I got it. All right. All right, here we go. Okay, um, all right. Uh, as authorized by WD 6.6.3, I, Scott Riley, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 23, 2021, accept the recommendations for DP 22-01 and authorize this application to move forward to growth management. The, uh, we have struck discretionary permit review from that last sentence. Uh, changes, um, 
the changes that have been made are on our screen. Do you want me to go through them? I do, yes, please. Okay, all right, very good. Um, recommendations uh, for the motion on number two, A, uh, provide the town an easement of 64 feet wide uh, has been added to the right of way of the property line with Christ Memorial Church. Uh, number four, adding these, a sentence uh, to the end that the traffic study shall include analysis of weekday morning and evening peak hours and a Sunday morning peak hour and shall include analysis of the site driveways and the Vermont 2A forward slash industrial avenue forward slash Mountain View Road intersections at a minimum. Adding number seven, <clears throat> depending on the results of the legal opinion being sought by the town for calculating density, the applicant may be required to subdivide the commercial element of the development from the residential component for density calculation purposes and may be required to calculate density using the acreage of the residential parcel only. Number eight, the applicant shall give special consideration to le relocation of the soccer field to minimize adjacent property impacts. Adding number nine, depending on the results of the legal opinion being sought by the town on, um, on the staff uh, accessory housing units, these units may be required to obtain growth management allocation. Adding number 10, the applicant should provide a 20 foot easement for future bicycle forward slash pedestrian improvements along the frontage of Mountain View Road. And uh, that is it. Great, thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, John. Any further discussion? No. No, I'm good. Okay. Yay, uh, yay, yay or nay, please. Uh, Paul Christensen. Yay. John Hemelgar. Yay. Uh, the chair is a yay. Scott Riley. Yay. Dave Turner. Yay. Five in favor, none opposed. Motion carries. Is there a motion for DP 22-02? That's the pre-app for the Trinity Baptist Church uh, for the uh, review of the proposed three lot residential subdivision. Pete, I can, um, I have a motion for that. Okay, thank you, John. As authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, John Hemmelgarn, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations to the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 23rd, 2021, accept as recommendations for DP 22-02, and authorize this application to move forward to growth management. <clears throat> we are going to make a couple of adjustments to the recommendations uh, <clears throat> drafted by staff. We are going to strike in its entirety uh, recommendation number 2B and recommendation 2D. And I believe that is, that's it. That was simple. Great. Okay. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any discussion? No. All set. Okay. Uh, Paul Christensen, yay or nay? Yay. John Hemmelgarn. Yay. The chair is a yay. Scott Riley. Yay. Dave Turner. Yay. Five in favor, none opposed, motion carries. Uh, next up is the appeal 22-01. Is there a, um, would it be a motion or a, or a? Just a reader, I'm assuming. What'd you say, Paul? I'm assuming it's just someone to read it. I don't think oh, it's a motion yeah. per se. Is it a motion? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it, it is a motion. It is, is there a motion. motion? Okay. Yeah, is, I, is, there, is there a motion for appeal 22-01? Yeah, I, I've got that, Pete. Okay, thanks, John. Go ahead. As authorized by WDB 5.4.6, I, John Hemmelgarn, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the appeal of the administrator's decision, all of the accompanying materials, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 23rd, 2021, accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law for APP 22-01 and appeal of the issuance of a certificate of compliance and modify the decision of the administrator to issue CC 22-09. Specifically, the board reinstates the temporary certificate of compliance with a new expiration date of June 30th, 2022. The appellee shall submit a detailed landscaping plan drawn to scale by a qualified landscape architect or designer covering the entire road frontage of the parcel to Old Stage Road and including additional planting. This landscaping plan shall be submitted to the Development Review Board for approval. Staff shall verify proper installation of the landscaping for compliance with the approved landscaping plan prior to the issuance of a final certificate of compliance. To go along with that motion, the, uh, the conclusions of law shall read, number one, the revised landscaping plan submitted for AP 21-0120 does not meet the requirements of WDB 23.3. Number two, the zoning administrator did not issue CC 22-09 in conformance with AP 21-0120 and DP 18-08, conditions of approval and final plans. And uh, lastly, the zoning administrator did not issue CC 22-09 in conformance with the procedures of WDB chapter seven. Thank you, John. Is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, is there a discussion? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Paul Christensen, yay or nay? Nay. John Hamilgarn. Yay. The chair is a yay. Scott Riley. Yay. Dave Turner. Yay. Uh, four in favor, one opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Trustee Phelan has a question. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, so I'm wondering if the DRB can provide me with a clear, clearer definition of what the type one landscape buffer is. Um, when, when I had gone to the zoning administrator, he had told me that I was within the definition. And so the DRB is saying I'm not within the definition. So I would appreciate some clarity from the DRB um, so that I can come up with an appropriate plan. Uh, a type one buffer, a landscape buffer composed primarily of existing woodland or forest that must be of sufficient height and density to provide an effective visual buffer. Where this buffer is proposed, it should include photographic documentation of its effectiveness. The landscaping plan shall also propose supplemental new plantings where existing vegetation is too thin to be an effective visual buffer. This type, it, this type of buffer must be relatively wide to sustain its habitat value and to function as a woodland or forest that needs only minimal maintenance. Right, and, and so when I worked with the zoning administrator, he felt like I had met that. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I, I'm, I'm just confused. Like I, I want to be in compliance, but I thought I was, but it turns out that I'm not. So I'm not really sure what else, what I need to do from here. I, I need some more guidance. Well, the guidance is to submit a, is to submit a plan scale that goes along the entire front of the, of the road. That would be a good start. Something and, not on a napkin. 
and uh, you, you know, I would recommend that you use a, um, you know, somebody who is used to developing those those plans and uh, has done that in the past. And I would also recommend that that you get out ahead of this and uh, develop that plan and submit it early to the DRB. This is this is going to require. Um, not a lot of review on our part. So we, we're gonna be happy to fit that into the next meeting that uh, we have um, after receipt of that plan. And we'll provide you feedback um, that, same, that same evening. And so, um, you know, get ahead of this. What we didn't feel that what was there was was adequate, and uh, and we also viewed the the quality and the professionalism of the plan, um, and and that's not intended to be critical of whoever did it. It doesn't matter. We just didn't feel that that um, was um, met 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 our expectations, and so we're looking for a scaled landscaping plan that meets the criteria that Emily just read. And again, we, we, we want to work with you. We don't want to make this process difficult, uh, but we didn't feel that what you uh, have done today was sufficient. Okay, thank you. Anything else uh, in the chat? No, just something about some Twitter comments. I think we're okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so now, again, we're going a, a bit out of order tonight. Uh, so before we go into the public hearings, as warned, um, we're going to do a public forum. This is an opportunity for anyone here in the room or participating by Zoom. Uh, to comment on uh, anything that is not on tonight's agenda. Uh, so the floor is yours uh, if you have a comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Anyone in the room? Ma'am, could you please uh, state your name and address for the record, please? Yeah, Donna Rosa. So I just had a question. Um, I noticed as I'm going to a maple tree parking lot. There's something that has mushrooms there. Um, there's some equipment, maybe some supplies or something with a fence around it. And I'm wondering, did that have to get some sort of permitting to be there? Or, you know, how, how does that work? It just, it's pretty unsightly. And I'm just thinking of the people that are living in those apartments. For years, they had to look out their backyard to look at that Vermont gas junkyard for years. And now they look out their front yard, front windows, and they see this thing that has mushroomed over the last month or two. So I'm just wondering how that's occurred. Did it have to be permitted? Is it allowable? Just some general information about that. Great, thank you. Um, so that is a staging area for DEW construction. I'm employed by DEW construction, so I'm going to recuse myself from answering that and ask staff to answer, please. So this is behind Maple Tree Place housing. It's right in the parking lot. It's actually like I don't know in front of. Maybe the INF building, you know, it's it's in the parking lot of Maple Tree. You know, it's south South Zephyr Road in in Maple Tree Place. This is the first I'm hearing of it. I just want to confirm there. Were, what's the, is it near like on the the south end of Maple Tree Place? Is it near Best Buy? Or, no, know, it's it's, it's behind. Uh, Emily, it's behind the. Um, the 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 uh, where the the deli the deli was and uh, the, the jewelry store. 
Okay. And it's right. It's right across the road from the from the houses. It is. It's in the. It's underneath the Velco right of way. <laughs> if that helps too. I know exactly where that is. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I know you recused yourself from the conversation, but um, can you tell everybody what project that's related to? Uh, sure. So there's trifling. She must be from Dirty Dog. So there's a uh, there's a GSA project that's in the uh, the office portion of the. Of the Maple Tree built Maple Tree Place buildings, so you know how the office buildings kind of wrap around the green. There's offices in there, and one of them, one of the tenants is the is the GSA, and the GSA is is uh, is renovating a space. EW Construction is the contractor, and um, and that fencing area is a staging area for equipment and materials for that project and it's away from the building to not take up um, more uh, prime parking spaces. So that's in the in, so that's why it's there is to avoid uh, being next to the building and take up parking spaces. And the duration that it's going to be there is uh, it, it, I, I don't know exactly, but it, I don't think it's more than another like three months. It's not a it's not a big project. It's a renovation inside. So is something like that require some sort of permitting from the town? Temporary staging area that impacts parking. Usually it's either included in whatever the permit is for the work, or if it's relatively minor, um, we may not do a, a permit individually for that. Um, it really it really depends. So. I don't have access to my hard drive, but I, I think the GSA work is, is not at, at the level where it's even required a permit from the town. Uh, so I, I don't think we have a record of this one. I just, I, I'm just commenting because it's pretty unsightly. And, that, you know, the, the people, there's housing right there and they're looking out at it. And I, I don't think it looks very, the representation for the town. And so I was just wondering if something like that does require, I didn't know if it had come before this board and been approved. No, it, it wouldn't come before the BRB. Um, typically, like I, I, another Maple Tree Place example is the, the, the bank conversion of the former men's warehouse site on the other side of the project. And, you know, we have we have a permit out that allows all those interior and exterior changes. Uh, that that in that course of that project, there would also be some outdoor storage of stuff, which is kind of just assumed. Um, so on a on a low level project, that may not have even required a permit. Occupying some parking spaces and some temporary storage, if it dragged on for a long long time, we might eventually ask the property manager to relocate something like that or, or gain a permit for it. But the other part is if somebody wanted to temporarily use a portion of the parking lot for construction staging for work on site, we would we would permit that. Yeah. Um, so 17.14 does have some standards about um, the storage of temporary construction stuff that it not impede access, um, that there be some security um, around it. So we could go take a look at it and make sure that the parking can still circulate, or vehicles can still circulate around and that security is being met. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to rush this, so you, you guys tell me when you want me to transition to the next one. You're, you're okay. 
I just don't want to overstep my bounds. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other public forum discussion or comments? Okay, hearing none, uh, we're now going to transition to agenda item number three, which is the public hearing. Uh, first up is PP 22 03 Riley Cohen Partnership LLC requesting a discretionary permit to establish an 800 square foot outdoor storage area at 156 Avenue B. Oh, Pete, hey, Pete? Yes, sir. Um, I am going to recuse myself from DP 22 03. Uh, and I am going to recuse myself from DP 09-01.24. Uh, I have a financial interest in both of these hearings. All right, so you are uh, a member of the audience for the rest of the evening. I am a member of, yes, I will not be rejoining. But, okay, thank you, Scott. So yep. noted. Okay, so uh, from a quorum perspective then, um, that puts us at at four, so we still have a quorum. Okay, uh, Andy, uh, you're representing the applicant. If you would introduce yourself and your address for the record, please. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me, Andy Rowe, Lemmer Road, Dickinson, 14 Morris Drive, Essex. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, is there anybody, uh, anyone else, or are you solely? Uh, <clears throat> My name is uh, Mark Wayman from BBC Property Maintenance. We occupy the space. And have applied for the Great. And your address, please? So it's the 156, 156 Avenue B. 156 Avenue B. Okay. Street, Street. Great. And you're just? Matthew Cohen, one of the owners of the property. Oh, great. Okay. And your address? Our home address is okay. too many talk Lane, but the address of the property is 156 Avenue B. Okay, we'll go with 156 Avenue B uh, as okay. Matt's address. Uh, okay, staff's up first. Sorry about that. Riley Cohen Partnership LLC requests a discretionary permit to establish an approximately 800 square foot outdoor storage area at 156 Avenue B located in the industrial zoning district West. The property is currently developed with multiple commercial industrial uses. Staff's recommending approving the discretionary permit application as proposed with findings and conditions of approval as drafted. Um, this property has existed since at least the early 1980s um, and just was part of the original uh, Griswold Industrial Park. Uh, recently, there's only been uh, permits issued for changes in signage. Um, no advisory boards reviewed the project. Uh, the Public Works Fire and Police reviewed the project. The Department of Public Works and Fire Department submitted comments um, and staff is recommending that the applicant communicate with those departments regarding compliance with their standards. No comment letters were received at the time of the mail out. Um, the uses on the site include uh, rental and leasing services, linen and uniform supply and property management services, all existing um, uses are allowed in this district, industrial zoning district west. Um, the existing site and the proposed structure comply with respect to dimensional standards, including the minimum lot furniture requirement, the um, maximum allowed building height, and the minimum front yard setback. The minimum rear and side yard setbacks are controlled by the landscape buffer requirements of chapter 23 and the existing site um, is not in compliance with today's standards. Um, 
outdoor storage is permitted in the zoning district, but only within side and limit yards that are designated for that purpose on an approved site plan. Um, outdoor storage must be buffered from public ways and adjoining properties. Um, the DRB can require a uh, screening fence. Um, the applicant is proposing outdoor storage for the property management tenancy on the site. A 13 foot by 20 foot by 14 foot high tent structure is proposed for salt storage during winter months and mulch storage during summer months. The tent is proposed to be placed on concrete blocks. A 20 foot by 25 foot concrete block bunker is proposed for storage of landscape materials. Both the tent and the, out and the outside storage will be located on the existing paved surface outside of the proposed nine foot rear yard setback. Um, staff is recommending that the proposed outdoor storage complies and that um, because the proposed structures will be enclosed, no additional screening um, should be required. Um, the subject parcel is non-conforming with respect to landscape buffers and rear and, yard, and, rear and side yard setbacks. Um, Per WDB 2.8, the DRB may require that nonconformities be corrected as a condition of approval um, for, of a discretionary permit for additional development on the same lot. Um, this power is limited to requiring work that is reasonably proportional to the scale of the proposed development. The proposed project requires a discretionary permit because the subject property is an existing commercial industrial site. The applicant is proposing an accessory structure greater than 120 square feet, and the proposed structure is not attached to an existing building. <clears throat> so the uh, landscaping, you see this is, uh, the existing landscaping is shown on the site plan. The subject parcel is adjacent to a public way um, and heavy commercial and industrial parcels to the north, east, and south. The property's side and rear setbacks do, don't comply with the landscape buffer requirements. The DRB must decide if the scale of proposed development warrants the requirement to bring the landscaping into compliance with the standards. A nine foot type three buffer would be most feasible and could be reduced with a fence. Um, the DRB should modify the draft conclusion of law and condition of approval for landscaping requirements um, according to whatever uh, you decide. Um, per WDB 26.1.2, street trees are required along the existing road fringe of redevelopment projects. Um, <clears throat> WDB 26212 requires street trees and non residential developments to be planted at least 40 feet along every 40 feet along the road. The subject parcel has a few street trees that would need to be supplemented with additional trees to meet the current standards of WDB chapter, should be 26. The DRB must decide if the scale of the proposed development warrants the requirement to bring the landscaping into compliance with current standards. And um, the DRB should modify the draft conclusion of law and conditions of approval for street tree requirements accordingly. Um, the development has two existing curb cuts on Avenue B. The proposed addition of an outdoor storage structure will not require changes to access, parking, on-site infrastructure, outdoor lighting, and or signage, and no changes are proposed. The site is not within any conservation areas, watershed protection buffers, or flood hazard areas. The proposed project will not involve disturbance of land and will not result in additional impervious area. Um, and chapters 27, 28, and 29 are not applicable to the proposed project. Um, impact fees may be assessed at the discretion of the zoning administrator. And um, that's all I have, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Andy, I'm going to start with a, a couple of financial questions. Um, what's the engineer's estimate for this project? And so in other words, what did you put on the, what would you put on the permit application for value of this project? That's question number one. Question number two is, 
Um, have you done a, uh, a, a financial projection of the landscaping cost if you were to put it in to compliance with the current bylaws? Where I'm going with this is I'm trying to understand if that request is reasonable from a financial perspective. So if you were, you know, doing fifty thousand dollars worth of work and had twenty thousand dollars worth of landscaping, that probably would be disproportionate. Well, we haven't done a cost estimate, but yeah, sure I can work in this. I can tell you that I already have all the existing materials to build this bulk tank and storage bed. It's transferred from another property. Um, but I can tell you that the materials um, are about $800 worth of materials. It's just concrete blocks and a, and a shelter logic tank with some plywood in it. Yeah, that's helpful. The, the tank is about 580 concrete blocks, about 40 bucks a piece, a couple of pieces of plywood. That's it. Okay, that's helpful. It's not it's not permanently attached to the ground, it's just sits on it. On it. Um, Andy, the floor is yours for um, any other comments that you may have. You want me to comment on number two? <laughs> as far as the, but we haven't done a, a cost estimate on what the landscaping oh. would require. Oh, okay. Um, my, my question number two. Yes. Yes. So just to describe what's there, um, there was previously gravel parking along the two side yards that, you know, there's some vegetation coming in on the gravel. Um, particularly along the uh, north side um, that's shared in common with Casella, um, a little more so on the south side, and the existing edge of pavement basically runs along the rear property line. So if there was any landscaping to be done, the first thing that would need to be improved would be the soil conditions, whether it was along the side uh, yards or in the back, you'd have to cut the pavement, take both the pavement and the gravel up and Put a suitable soil medium down there in order for anything to grow in it. So um, there'd be a cost associated with first improving it and then secondly placing any kind of plant material there. Okay. Understood. Any other any other comments on uh, the staff report or the proposed conditions of approval? No, obviously we'd like the board to find in favor of the applicant in terms of the landscaping and the street trees. Um, I think Melinda noted in the staff report that uh, 10 street trees would be required. There's six there now, a mix of, I think there's one large pine tree and I think the rest are maples. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else to add on the proposed conditions? I don't think there is. No. Okay. There's, there's three in front of the building from the things that actually have there are six to seven trees that have been there. Right, there are some additional foundation plantings, particularly around the front of the building and the south side. Yep. DRB members, questions, please. The only question I had was I couldn't hear Andy if he said the pavement went all the way to the back of the boundary line. Yes, the, uh, the existing edge of pavement roughly runs along the rear property line now. And there is some gravel area beyond that that's been used in the past, but the, the edge of the pavement is essentially the, the rear property line. Okay. And you use right up to the property line, I'm assuming. The, or the, the client uses right up to the property line. Historically, yes. Um, this the, the two structures that are being proposed, the tent structure and the bunker, would be placed in nine feet so that it complies with that nine foot setback or landscape buffer, even though there's not a landscape element there, it would still be set back from the property line. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So uh, I, I, I'm trying to look at this site plan, which is kind of a gray blob on my, my packet. I'm not. I'm not totally sure exactly where the where the tent is being proposed to go. Uh, Simon, would you put the site plan up on the screen, please? Okay. 
the signature. So the, the 10 on top of the concrete blocks is due east of the southeast corner of the building. And then the bunker, which is U-shaped, is immediately north of that. All right. So it's behind the building from the road. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is that was this plan in our packet? I'm uh, I'm sorry. I'm, yes. I, I, I I'm not finding it here. Oh wait, hold on. It's with the letter. All right. I think I just found the, the right paper clip. All right. I I apologize. And as you know, I'm I I do know how to read the plans. Um, and it, now that I have this uh, plan in front of me, I realize that that was a stupid question. Um, so, all right, thank you. No problem, John. Uh, any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Uh, members of the audience, both here in the building or that are participating by Zoom, any questions? And if you do have a question, uh, please do use the raise hand feature um, or put a message in the chat and uh, like or something. Uh, well, I'll mute you. Yeah, hang on. Uh, Paul, do you have a question? Yeah, the only question I would have is uh, what would it cost to throw? Just throw a couple trees in the front of the building. That's it. Well, I think uh, I think we know I think we know what a couple trees would cost, so we can talk about that in uh, in deliberation. Not nothing else. Make nothing else points out on this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, John has a question. Okay. Go go ahead. Just a quick question. Um, so this discussionary permit, is this a limited or is it indefinite? Uh, if, if it's granted, you know. Yeah, this, this, this has no time limit on it. Okay. So the only question, I, the reason I ask that is because in the attachment, it says here, when in this garage in the box, it says it's a temporary structure and not recommended as a permanent structure. So I'm kind of wondering if, this is intended as a temporary, and you're giving a discretionary permit that's indefinite. It's kind of contradictory to me. So, you want me to get uh, Yeah, yeah. No, I do. So, the, well, and I don't want to speak in terms of the permit, but the, the well, permit's approval, well, the permit approval would be permanent. Um, the structure might get replaced after two or three years. If the, you know, the materials may be replaced if the tent wears out or if there's damage to it or something like that. Um, the permit, the approval would continue and the materials may just get replaced. So you could replace this with something else and you wouldn't have to come back for a discretionary permit. No, no it'd, have to, it'd have to be replaced in kind. Okay. Sorry, yes. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's not really a whole lot different than a roof, which has a useful life. It's uh, it's just that in the industry, these types of structures are deemed temporary, which is which is really symbolic of their useful life, which is which is not long. But the but the permit would would mean that uh, the applicant would have the right to replace in kind the same the same. Uh, structure um, without having to go back to the permit process. Any other questions? Any other questions from the public? Uh, no, I'm not, not seeing any more. You do have a question, just raise your hand very quickly. It's just Chris is the. Uh, Okay. Uh, last call for questions, DRB members? No. Nope. I'm good. Good. Okay. Andy? Nothing. 
Uh, any last questions from the public? Okay, hearing none. Uh, I have 751. We're going to close DP 22 03. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to open DP 09 01.24, uh, which is the Snyder Commercial Properties LLC and Riley Properties LLC. This is a uh, request for a discretionary permit to construct uh, building F, as in Frank, on Holland Lane. Uh, who is representing the applicant? Andy, you are, and Chris Snyder? Yes. Okay, Andy, if you would uh, state your name and address for the record again, please. Andy Rowe, Lemon Rowe Dickinson, 14 Morris Drive, Essex. Mr. Snyder, good evening. If you would state your name and address for the record, please. Yep. Uh, Chris Snyder with the uh, Snyder FC Commercial Properties uh, in address of 4076 Shelburne Road, Suite 6, Shelburne. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, first up is, next up is staff. Uh, this is a request for a discretionary permit to construct a three-story senior living facility with 74 units structure and surface parking, outdoor lighting, and resident amenities at 668 Zephyr Road. The 72 units will be 39 two bedrooms and 35 one bedrooms. Currently, this is an undeveloped parcel. It has frontage on town and private road that says state of its town. Um, it's located in the top corner zoning district where it is subject to design review, but not conservation commission review. Tonight, staff is recommending that the DRB take testimony and close the hearing, deliberate, and make a recommend and make a, an approval. Uh, as I review the staff report, I'm going to focus mainly on the points for the DRB to discuss tonight, which is architectural design, the number of access points, landscaping, particularly particularly along Holland Lane and at the Market Street corner off-street parking, and the number and location of trash cans. The DRB may choose to continue the hearing and request a, a shared parking study to reduce the amount of surface, service parking proposed, and I'll go on in detail later. Um, Project Tinge Street is summarized here. Finney Crossing began uh, permitting in 2003. Most recently, the, the DRB approved the urban park site plan and building H restaurant site plan. The HAC, the Historic and Architectural Advisory Committee, did provide comment and their recommendations are included. Public Works and Fire also commented on this application and their recommendations are included. I will note that the Fire Department originally requested a drivable surface through that courtyard on the north side of the building, um, but they backed off the request after dis um, discussing the other fire safety measures that are within the building. <clears throat> No comment letters were received from the public at the time of mail out, which was December 9th, nor have we received a letter to date. Uh, what follows is a summation of the pre application recommendations made by the DRB and the applicant's response. In general, they responded to the operational elements that must be provided in a senior living facility, such as on site staffing, uh, the commercial kitchen providing one meal a day, laundry linen surface, service and a variety of indoor and outdoor community spaces. Um, the applicant on the right side, you can see their responses to the pre-app recommendations about architectural elements, uh, the concrete foundation exposure, uh, awnings over emergency exits, et cetera, um, the screening of mechanical equipment, uh, and the landscaping plan for the area north. I will note that at pre-app, the DRB did request a shared parking study. The applicant declined to provide one. I'll go into that further soon. Um, invested rights. I do note that the select board approved a bylaw revision um, that does apply to this application. Most importantly, that the new parking standards are being applied here, and we did include a copy of that chapter to the DRB in the packet. Uh, retirement homes without nursing care are considered a health care and social assistance use, which is allowed in this zoning district. 
Um, and in general, we're finding that it complies by providing those um, on site services and staffing in the kitchen, et cetera. Uh, complies with the dimensional standards. I do know that there is the Velcro easement that constrains where buildings can be located on the site. Um, and development pattern in general, the application complies. The DRB should review the HAC recommendations about architectural elements. Uh, the standards in Chapter 41 are very similar about um, a distinguished foundation and base, a distinguished top, um, and breaking up building mass. This building is approximately 46 feet, um, and typically building height is limited to 36 feet, but there is an allowable increase where 30% or greater of the parking is provided in the structure. In this case, they are providing about 93% of their required parking underneath the building, uh, where they're permitted to have a height incentive. And this is to allow three or four story buildings. They are proposing three stories. Finney Crossing overall complies with the five of nine criteria, and that's summarized here. And growth management is not included. Though senior living does have a residential appearance and function, it is a commercial use and not subject to growth management. Access, connectivity, and traffic studies. The DRB should discuss the number and location of access points. There are two shared access points with the neighboring apartment building, uh, one on Zephyr Road that's highlighted here on the site plan, and another one on um, Holland Lane, which is to the north, just outside of the photo. There is a third access point proposed onto Market Street, and the DRB should discuss um, this additional access point. It does provide circulation through the main entrance port co share and to some surface parking. Um, as well as how the proposed curb cut lines up with the one at Union Bank. I double checked with Public Works. Their specifications don't have anything about how the driveways line up to it, one another, um, but seeing it off might be a better intersection. Off street parking and loading. Um, I'll be brief here, and if you guys have follow up questions, I can answer them. Uh, the DRB can approve the 112 parking spaces using the increase allowed in chapter uh, in the chapter, but the DRB should discuss shared parking as an option to reduce surface parking. So those 112 parking spaces, 69 are in the garage, 43 are surface. Uh, the bylaw requirement for senior housing independent living is one space per unit, which would require 74 spaces. Um, while the applicant did provide a shared study uh, because the north building, the building to the north building A3 is residential um, and they both have peak parking demand times that coincide, senior living and residential um, are similar uses. Um, they could do a shared parking study with other parking lots within a thousand, a thousand feet, such as the healthy living building, the LL Bean building that's under construction or Union Bank. And those are within Fernie Crossing, so they are eligible for that shared parking analysis. The DRB has two options tonight. One, approve the 112 spaces as proposed, and those increased options are a parking structure or solar canopy, forest pavement, providing spaces for alternative fuel and carpool, um, and additional accessible spaces. I won't go into detail there, but at final plans, they would need to show how those various parking spaces are being allocated, um, and which could get them to 112 spaces. Um, alternatively, there is the option to um, do documentation of additional parking demand, where the study uh, using the methodology in the new parking chapter could uh, determine if there is an opportunity for shared parking within this development. Um, and that leads me to option two, which would be to continue the hearing and request that shared parking analysis. Um, what that would reasonably result in is a reduction in the 43 surface parking spaces on the site. <coughs> uh, short term bicycle parking uh, does comply. Additional long-term bicycle storage must be provided um, and end of trip facilities for the employees would be shared with building E, the adjacent LLB building. 
final plans would need to specify uh, these additional elements. Are there any questions about parking before I wrap up on the other sections? I think we're probably going to be going back to that, so continue. Okay. <laughs> Um, on-site infrastructure complies as proposed in terms of utilities and municipal water and sewer. Um, maintenance, final plans would need to show specifications for on-site storage or removal. Uh, the DRB should discuss the number of trash receptacles. So there are trash receptacles shown um, near the primary entrance for the senior living facility, as well as within their private patio area to the north. The DRB might consider additional receptacles near the street corners for people walking along the sidewalks. Um, and solid waste complies as proposed. The trash and recycling dumpsters are within the parking structure. Uh, final plans must specify how rooftop and ground mounts and mechanical will be screened and shielded with a parapet so it's not visible from public roads uh, nearby. Um, and design review. The HAC reviewed this application on November 16th, and they had four primary comments. Um, number one, um, enhancing the roof line. The fascia board proposed that the white pitch, pitched roof, um, a recommendation that that gets strengthened and continued were highlighted along the, the white massing of the building, um, as well as a stronger cornice um, were highlighted on the gray part of the building. In general, they found that the building masses are too minimalist and too small and provide a cornice that has interest but is not overwhelming. Number two, the hack recommended a variety of shrubs and perennials between the street trees along Holland Lane and Market Street to enhance the pedestrian experience. So walking down that sidewalk, it's a very long building frontage and they felt more plantings would uh, provide some visual interest. Uh, between the trees. Number three, uh, they discussed the Holland Lane and Market Street corner, uh, where additional landscaping and benches uh, would be able to complement the urban park across the street. Currently, there is a utility box that's shown in that vicinity. You can see it on the site plan to the right. Um, it's not shown in the architecturals to the left because the architectural renderings are focused on the building and not the site plan elements. Um, so moving that utility to box to the north away from the street corner if possible, and then enhancing this area, um, making it a comfortable pocket park. Lastly, the hack made a recommendation about the uh, resident area to the north of the building. This is in essence their backyard. Uh, they requested more clustered seating, benches and pairs facing each other. You can see here that there are uh, community gardens um, with a hydrant or a hose hookup proposed. Uh, there is a covered patio and an open air patio that will have, um, you know, residential garden seating, um, some grilling stations, etc. The hack would just like to see more benches where people can socialize outdoors. Uh, landscaping and street trees. Um, I just reiterate what the hack said about the type of plantings along Holland Lane and Market Street, um, and that you can choose to amend uh, that hack recommendation. Uh, in general, what they provide, they recommended would make the street tree standard something more like a type three or a type four buffer, where it's, um, a variety of major trees, ornamental trees, and some shrubbery, um, and these types of buffers are appropriate along public ways. And again, that highlight of where the escape heads could go. Outdoor light, lighting uh, compliance is anticipated and at final plans, they would just need to provide a couple additional, additional specs on um, the lighting of the backyard and courtyard areas, as well as dimming of the surface parking light, parking lot during overnight hours. <clears throat> um, motion sensor lighting is encouraged and should be noted on final plans. I will note that the maximum point of illumination is um, below the 5.0 foot camera threshold. Uh, no signs or public art are proposed um, and impact fees. Uh, Non-residential projects are exempt from school and recreation impact fees. Uh, this application would be um, eligible or um, 
would have to pay transportation impact fees, but because Finney Crossing built Zephyr Road, um, they still have about a million dollars of in-kind credit between the cost of construction, constructing the road and um, all of the impact fees that would have been assessed for every um, residential unit and commercial unit in Finney Crossing. So they have about a thousand dollars of buffer there. Uh, what follows is findings of fact, conditions of approval for the DRB's consideration. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Emily. Andy and Chris, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate uh, that, Emily, in, in walking through. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as we have said all along, you know, we do appreciate all the time and effort um, that the um, DRB puts into our applications for these projects. And so we do appreciate, again, your time and focus as we do feel like we do improve our, our buildings and the overall project uh, by going through the process. Um, we did listen and, and have stayed focused on the feedback um, um, received over the last couple of months. And I think that this uh, discretionary permit application incorporates a lot of those <laughs> items. Um, as you all know, there's 74 apartments as proposed. We have um, uh, aesthetically, I think we've really been focused on the uh, roof lines and uh, components of uh, the architectural components of the roof lines. And so that we can make sure that they um, are representative of what people want to see on this uh, new building. Uh, we do have a mix of pitched and flat roofs, and uh, we have highlighted the pitched roofs more than we have the flat roofs. And in uh, some of the discussion that has been brought up during the hack and some of the comments earlier, uh, you know, we're trying to highlight the pitched versus the um, flat roofs. And so there is some a little bit more focus on that as we take a look at this. Um, you know, I would say, you know, we would be more than willing to walk through the staff report um, and go over any questions that um, people have in terms of, you know, the, I think the biggest component is in the parking. Um, and it is our um, desire to maintain the current number of parking spaces on the property. We understand the rules have changed. Of course, they changed within like seven days of when we were, uh, had submitted. Um, and I think we didn't realize that that was gonna be of impact. But for us in this particular instance, you know, we do feel like we need to maintain the um, number of parking spaces. It is lower than what we've had in our other apartment buildings. And it's somewhat in between uh, uh, what is, you know, outlined and uh, what we would um, like to have. Uh, do you understand that this is a age restricted senior housing? We are going to be providing services. However, we do envision that, you know, uh, well, I'm not that far from 55 and I could be living here and uh, my wife and I would both have a car and have, you know, probably both work. So I, I think what we're envisioning is that there's a, a mix of residents um and um that there would be potentially two cars uh with some of the unit types uh that we will be have uh offering uh so i think parking is important i think aesthetics are important i think we can certainly walk through we can walk through the other staff um notes and and go from there unless andy do you have anything else not, not before we go to the specific items. Okay. Uh, I think what I think what I'd like to do is have Simon put the site plan on the screen, and Andy, if you could walk us through the the site plan and the current um, uh, the current methodology that was used for the. You know, for the parking, um, address 
that utility box and what might be in that utility box um, and how realistic it might be to relocate that if that is a possibility, what the challenges might be with relocating that. And also address the intersection. It doesn't line up directly with the uh, healthy living. Um, healthy, li I guess it would be the bank, right? Yeah, it's it Union Bank. bank. Yeah, that would be the Union Bank um, uh, exit and what, what you could do to get those lined up and what would be from a civil engineer's perspective, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of that. Um, so why don't you why don't you start with 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 those as a uh, to kind of kick off this discussion? So and, and you can um, I, I don't know if you've got a pointer or if you want to just go to the screen or I, it's it's your call. One time I didn't bring a pointer. I, didn't. <laughs> I can do annotate on the screen. I I can also help you, Andy, along here if we want to talk about. Some of, I, I think I have some information too, uh, but so between the two of us, we can do this. Right. So let's start at the access off uh, Market Street. That's actually an existing curb cut. Um, and the layout for this property looked much different with the um, prior master plan or concept plan, at least for this area. And there was previously a couple of parking areas here, one which was parallel with Zephyr Road and then a second one which was a little further to the west. And just the way that laid out with the buildings that were originally envisioned for this area, um, the curb cut didn't align with the, the curb cut to buildings A and B directly across uh, Market Street. So um, one of the things that we had done between the board's pre-application review in this one uh, was try to pull that parking and the um, access drive to the Port share for building F back together and further away from Zephyr Road. Um, the the pre-application plans had that curb cut being moved closer to Zephyr Road. We were trying to keep it further away and utilize the existing curb cut that is there. Um, you know, having them aligned would be ideal uh, the layout that we have there now is utilizing that, that curb cut as it exists. Um, I believe the sidewalk, uh, actually the sidewalk isn't there, it's built on the other side. Um, the curb cuts for the sidewalk in the, uh, in the curb are there, the depressions in the, in the curb are there, but nothing other than that from Zephyr Road into this curb cut, but again, the curb cut itself is there. Um, I guess just one note, might not be clear from this plan, but the uh, the, the access um, to the Port share is one way um, from north to south. So people would come in off Zephyr Road or come in off Holland Lane. They could come in off Market Street and circulate through that proposed parking area as well. Um, but after they're dropping off on the passenger side, they would need to come back into that parking area closest to Zephyr Road between the end of Building F and Zephyr Road. But can take questions or we can kind of continue around the building. Uh, continue around the building. Okay. I, I, I actually have a question on that. I'm sorry. All right. um, uh, Andy, did you just say that if, if you drop somebody off at the Port to Share that you would have to go back to the proposed parking area? Or if you had taken your dad out to, to, to lunch and you wanted to drop him off and then we're going home, couldn't you leave onto Market Street? Yes, yes. If you were dropping somebody somebody off and then entering the building, you'd need to go into the parking lot. But um, right, if you were just dropping somebody off and then leaving, there was, there's no reason you couldn't leave. Okay. On the parking all right. Yes. All right. All right. So that that is a two way. That's intended to be a two way driveway there. Yes, it's a two way driveway. The only thing that would be one way would be from where the marks are being made now back to yes. uh, the north end. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I understand. And is there any reason why that wouldn't want to, why you couldn't, uh, other than the fact that it already exists, that that couldn't be made to line up with uh, the, the, the driveway across the street? Is there any internal to site uh, F reason to, to keep it uh, further um, south? 
No, I mean, there may be a street light that might need to get relocated, although I think it may be to the south or excuse me, to the east along Market Street. But okay, the whole curb cut could be shifted to the west. Okay. Your crystal ball just failed you early, from, from earlier, huh? Correct, yes. Okay, all right, so thank uh, you. What about the utility? While I'm thinking of it, the utility box that was yep. pointed out, go ahead. So I, I you know, that was a, a good comment that we got from the hack, um, not only on the utility box, but, you know, providing uh, a little bit of seating on that corner not to be a park necessarily, but to complement the park um, that's to the south across Market Street, as well as the larger park uh, to the west across Holland Lane. Uh, and I believe Chris has been, well, let me first, that's a transformer. Um, this building was originally intended to be served from the transformer on the south side of Market Street that is being installed to serve building E. However, if this building is served from that transformer, there's no future capacity. There wouldn't be any capacity to add vehicle charging stations, for example. There wouldn't be any any excess capacity whatsoever. So um, Green Mountain Power is looking for that uh, additional transformer on this side of the street to serve building F. Um, Chris has been talking with Green Mountain Power and I think they are okay with moving it north along Holland Lane. Um, there's probably a happy medium there, not going too far, um, you know, up moving it so close that that entryway, um, even though it is just to a stairwell, um, you know, that it detracts from that, but certainly moving it further away from the intersection of Holland Lane and Market Street, so that some landscaping can be done there to improve the appearance of that intersection and, and get the transformer a little further up. Um, it, you know, it's probably halfway between where it is now and the stairway entrance where the green space fattens out there a little bit is probably its ideal location with some screening around it. And, and sort of I'll add to that uh, in, in Scott uh, and I and the, uh, one of our contractors was looking at this today and after uh, more discussion about it, it looks like we are going to be able to take that up to about where the hand is um, right now um, and get it out of the corner. Um, it just means it'll be closer, uh, you know, to be 10 feet away from the building or so, somewhere around in that location. So it can be relocated to that area. Right. Right. Okay. Continue, Andy. Uh, do we want to talk about architectural design or parking next? Uh, let's go right into parking. Okay. You want to start on that one, Chris, or do you want me? Uh, go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess just to summarize what's in the staff report, uh, 112 spaces are being proposed, which works out to one and a half spaces per unit. Um, the bylaw provides for one space per unit for independent senior living, for comparison, it used to be 1.75 for multifamily. It's up to two now with sort of an automatic 20% discount. Um, so it, it went up, but it perhaps didn't really go up. Uh, but just for comparison, so it, you know, one, one space per unit for independent senior living, 1.8 to two for multifamily. Um, of those 112 spaces that are being proposed, uh, 43 are, make sure I'm right here, 43 are on the surface, um, 69 being located in the parking garage. Um, and I think we're talking about 38 spaces um, being over. So either the need to convince the board that 1.5 is appropriate, or um, using the tools that are available in the bylaw to increase the parking by um, having additional accessible spaces, um, carpool or van spaces, or the third option. 
Forest. Um, forest pavement, but I think the, the third one that we'd be looking at is alternative fuel spaces, you know, having chargers and, uh, you know, using that is one tool in order to get to the 38 that would be needed. <clears throat> okay, so at this point, uh, Andy, I'd just ask you to pause for a moment. And Emily, if you could walk the DRV through kind of how that works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you look at figure one on page uh, page eight of the staff report, at one rate, one space per unit at 74 units, they get um, 74 parking spaces. Uh, because they have structured parking um, in the garage underneath, they can increase 25%. So 74 times 25% gets 19 parking spaces. Uh, forest pavement is a 15% increase. Uh, so 74 times 15, uh, they can get zero to 12 uh, additional parking spaces. And I have that uh, footnote uh, because um, sometimes forest pavement is challenged in Vermont. And they don't have to do forest pavement; it's an option, and they can supplement by then doing the alternative fuel spaces or the accessible parking spaces. Uh, both alternative fuel and accessible parking spaces. There's no percent limit in the bylaw. The same way structured parking, you can increase 25 percent, or forest pavement, you can increase 15 percent. So they could do uh, between two and 14 alternative fuel spaces and between five and 17 accessible spaces. Now our bylaw requires five ADA spaces. They proposed 10 ADA spaces. So they're already getting that additional um, five. So do the math 74 plus 19, uh, say you do your 10 ADA, 74 plus 19 plus 10 ADA, that's 103. Um, and then if they did say nine alternative fuel spaces, that would bring them to 112. And because there's different thresholds, uh, they could provide a combination of forest alternative fuel accessible that would get to that 112, and that can be worked out at final plans. Um, but it is possible to get to 112 without a shared parking analysis, just looking at those other increased options. And alternative fuel would be uh, an electric car would be an alternative fuel. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay, I understand that. Uh, so I, I have a I have a question, Pete. Yeah, I was gonna before you ask the question, John. Uh, okay. So DRV members, is there anyone on the DRV that has a question for Emily on that table and her calculations? Yes, Pete, I have a question on that. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I didn't, I didn't know if it was related to the table. No, it's okay. It, it's all good. Um, so on uh, the 14.2.4.4, the which says shared parking, comma, additional demand, are those uh, clearly, I, I understood that to say that, you know, with a shared parking, um, study you could you could show that there were additional parking spaces in the vicinity that could be used to increase the number of parking spaces what is the thing where it says additional demand explain that to me or correct me on the shared parking uh, assumption right so uh the quotation in number 1d above is directly from the bylaw Documentation of additional parking demand. The DRV may consider a study using the shared parking methodology in Appendix J, showing that the existing shared parking resources cannot serve the demand created by the new development. So what that statement is, looking at those existing commercial parking lots, they don't have the capacity to handle a senior living facility the additional demand that this new development is creating. So what what is the industry what does the industry say for uh, senior housing time of day vehicle usage? So if it were if it were a residential property where um, where it was more of a traditional um, 
people go to work Monday through Friday, they come back. I'm not talking about in a COVID world. Um, and, and then there's a retail establishment and that's busier during the day. A shared parking is a good fit for that environment. Now you've got senior living and senior living, the, um, uh, the, the activity of a senior living resident probably follows a different rhythm than that of someone who is in the traditional workplace. Um, what, what can, Chris, can you speak to that or Andy, can you give any insight on what the industry um, provides for data on that? Not in terms of demand necessarily, but in terms of um, you know peak demand, a multifamily building, for example, you know people are generally leaving for work during that peak hour time, whether it might be before, during, or after. Right. Um, you know we know from the peak hour trip generation, which is much lower for senior living than it is for a multifamily without right. age restriction. That you don't have that peak hour in the morning, so the act, you know the activity in the in the senior living is happening at a later time in the morning, not during the peak hour, and also at a sooner time in the evening. It's happening, you know, the centroid is closer to that midday than at the two ends. And that so that that's what that's what historically uh, that's what historic data would suggest. Right. Is is a little, starts a little later and ends a little earlier. Correct. Yeah, that would, that's intuitive. Yeah, okay. And I would also say that, you know, this is a 55 plus, it's not, you know, this is not a full care facility, you know, with uh, lots of uh, age groups, you know, we're, we're envisioning that there's a, you know, a lot of people who, as I said earlier, you know, are still working. Okay, uh, I'd like to open up discussion from the DRB on parking at this point because we're we're kind of in the middle of the parking discussion. Uh, Paul, do you have any questions or comments on parking? I think I think one twelve is a good number, and I think it's because if you sat there and said that everybody had two cars in the units and then there were visitors for like say a holiday event. They'll use all 112 spaces plus some more. So I'm good with 112. Uh, John, thoughts? Yeah, well, again, uh, I think I think that the the question, as I understand it, is not so much the, the 112, whether that's the right number or not. Um, I mean, I can. I mean, right off the, the 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 bylaw states that one per per unit, which is I find to be a, a astoundingly low for today's world, um, and the, the the independence that I think the uh, the uh, our older citizens uh, exhibit. Um, not to mention, as as Chris was saying, that fifty five is <laughs> fifty is nice. I God, I hope it's not very old. Um, I think the majority of the board would would find themselves on the above that north of that line. Um, but the, um, the 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 question in my mind is here that Emily has brought up is whether we we will should require this shared parking study for the other parking lots that are within the 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 distance that the bylaw suggests is close enough. Um, and that's that's a that's a harder one um because i guess i would uh, i'm i'm conflicted here because a thousand feet is still pretty far especially if you're going to visit someone in this facility um or if you live there and, and that's a plot spot where you're going to put your second car um i'm not sure that that's that's entirely um appropriate but i need to uh, I'm open to discussion on that, and I think we'll have to we'll have to thrice through it in my mind. Yep, I agree with all you just said, John. Uh, Dave Turner. Um, I agree too on the one twelve. Um, I I think we 
definitely should look at some alternative energy parking spaces to get there and stuff because of the way of the future and the requirements that are being put on a lot of places. So um, if we can incorporate those into the parking, um, I think that would be a wise thing to do. So as, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, but as I understand it is if the DRB were to, were to uh, accept the 112, then it would be incumbent upon the applicant and final plans to um, to satisfy uh, the I'm going to call them the the bonuses that the bylaws allow. And it, I, do I understand that correctly? Okay. And if we were to um, and 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 porous pavement, from my perspective, is not an option really in our environment. Agreed. Um, I, I don't think it is. But uh, so would would you be would the applicant be um, in, embracing um, that methodology? I mean, you yes. have to put EV charging stations, and you have to be following the roadmap that Emily has laid out. Yeah, we we feel that we can accomplish the parking spaces and uh, still meet the, you know, the, 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 the path that has been created here. Okay. okay. Yep. That's, that was my question. DRB members, are there um, uh, Paul, John, or Dave? Um, do, do any of you support um, the path of a, uh, of a shared parking study? Because uh, at the end of the day, um, we, uh, we, we kind of need to decide that in, a, in the public setting because I can't close the hearing if there's support for that. Um. I think I think so. Um, the as I understand the chart or the or Emily's roadmap, um, one of the one of the tools in that toolbox is indeed a shared parking study. Correct. Uh, well, that there's two options. One's a shared parking study. The second is the roadmap. Right, but within the roadmap, it, I believe that number four there is the, is a shared parking. Um, component that you could use to say that some of these parking spots are going to be that we're asking for and looking for are actually going to be located in a in a shared location, um, you know, further away. Um, That's an so, option. It's it's, not, it's a la carte, so they don't have to take that. They option. don't have to, but they could. So they what I'm good. hearing right now is that the question in front of us is whether we're going to require that. And therefore, um, you know, not not close the hearing, but continue it. I'm I'm in favor of not continuing the hearing, and leaving the shared parking component on in the in the roadmap or in the toolbox. I think is a better analogy um, that the the applicant can use if they decide that is the best path forward um, for um, for legitimizing the number of parking spots or or, or Get, getting it to an approvable state. Um, so I, I don't think I would, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to, to continue the hearing to, to require this shared parking study. Okay, Emily, you had, you, you had something. Thank yeah. you, Paul. You had something to say? So it, it is a subsection of one of their options to increase, but the reason I didn't just turf that off to final plans is because my under my expectation is that if a shared parking were to be done, that there would be adequate parking within those other parking lots, and then the site would have to get reconfigured to reduce the circle parking because there's stuff available across the street. Um, so that's why, yes, it is one of their increases, um, but I don't think a shared parking study is appropriate at final plans. It's something that should be approved as part of the discretionary approach. Hmm. Okay, so that's that's a twist on this, John. 
It is a twist on this. And I think a situation where it would be okay is okay, say it's a, a restaurant and a restaurant is going in right next to it and it wants to have its own lot and you say, well, you should share with that other lot. Most likely that shared parking study is gonna say, these restaurants have the same peak hours of demand and there's not gonna be enough parking. So that restaurant, other that new restaurant should be able to build new parking. Um, but because there's senior living with retail and the bank, there's I think ample opportunity for that share um, where the additional, the spaces they want above 74 could be offset with those existing spaces at LLB, Union Bank, et cetera. But I think that should happen in the open at that hearing and not at final point. I have a question if, if I don't know, um, you know, in terms of shared parking and, uh, you know, when I'm looking and thinking about shared parking, I'm thinking about uh, adjacencies and direct adjacencies and also like how do uh, parking lots overlap with different uh, use products. Typically, in, in my mind, when I'm looking at uh, parking and thinking, well, I could cross the street and go to that parking lot over there, I'm usually not thinking about that as a, a source of a shared parking uh, program. That if you look at, you know, uh, this parking lot for AB3 and the proposed senior, senior living facility, you know, essentially the parking lot that is between them are, you know, I mean, are we going to see some people from AB3 parking in some of the parking spots of uh, Building F? Yeah, <laughs> that's really a shared parking. We're, we're going we're gonna to have, they're going to intermingle with that overall parking space because they're directly connected. And if you slide west to where we propose building H and, and AB uh, A2, um, you're gonna see uh, if you scroll up, uh, uh, Simon, yeah, up there to the proposed restaurant and the parking lot there. If you think about that, again, it, they're an interconnected parking. And so I think shared parking um, works in that scenario and really works in that scenario when you have two different uses um, utilizing the same spaces. And so as we've noted and other people have commented on, you know, what we're proposing is to have, uh, you know, utilization of one and a half parking spots for the senior housing building and, you know, I think we have 1.75 for the apartments and, you know, but they're all going to be there at the exact same time. Uh, if it was an office use, I think that would be a different scenario. Um, and so we do need to plan for and understand that people are going to have cars. And as much as, you know, we all don't want people to have cars, they still do. So that's my perspective on shared parking. I think when you start crossing roads for uh, parking access, that is a little bit of a, uh, maybe it's a cumulative shared parking on the overall site, but in this particular location, it's like, hey, if they're connected. Um, so that's just my perspective on, on the shared parking piece. I don't know if that helps or hurts. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's, a practical view of how it would actually be used, which is helpful from my perspective. So the, the 140, oh, I'm sorry, 112 spaces, which is 1.5 per unit, that, that's essentially one space per unit plus another, what, 38 for visitors and staff. Is that right? That's correct. Or, where is staff parking? In that 38. And how many staff are in this building? Uh, they'll probably be, well, there's at least one full-time person. And then there'll be, you know, 
people rotating in and out. There'll be, you know, kitchen help during while the meal is being served. You know, I think, you know, they'll, there, there's going to be a minimum of one person there 24 hours a day. Right. Then you have the meal. And so you're going to have an influx at a certain period of time of whatever meal that is. And then you're also going to have these other service providers. So, I mean, will those rotate? Yeah. But so maybe it's uh, three or four or five parking spaces during certain periods of time um, on a, 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 over a period of time uh, that are used by staff. And then there's going to be visitors, you know, and just like there are with any apartment building. And the, so the visitors, I, I see it as visitors and staff that are going to likely want to use the shared parking potentially, uh, or could if it's full. But, but in reality, those people should be using that parking lot in front of the building. And if that yes. parking lot's not there, they would be forced across the street. That's correct. As well, as, if that parking lot weren't there, you would also have the second vehicle for any of the residents across the street. That's correct. And, and let's be honest, you know, the best news would be is, it, well, I think we have a great tenant in L.L. Bean and we have some other future tenants that we're talking to right now. You know, they're, the, the best news for everybody in the town of Wilston is that L.L. Bean is wildly successful in that they have lots of people who are coming to visit to the town to utilize that store. And, you know, the one thing we don't want to do is take up 30 parking spots or 20 parking spots because of, you know, uh, because of a uh, uh, shared parking analysis from the uh, adjacent senior apartment building. When, let's be honest, underneath, this, uh, uh, underneath the Velco easement, the only thing that really can get done underneath that is parking. <laughs> so it's, it's like, it's not the best thing in the world, uh, you know, to have the, the easement there, but at the same time, let's utilize the land as efficiently as we can, rather than letting it just sort of sit there. Because you don't want to put a park underneath it. You know, <laughs> from my perspective, you don't want to put, you can't put trees underneath it. You know, you have to be, uh, or well, they can be trees, but they, you know, they're like four feet tall. Shrubbery. Uh, shrubbery. shrubbery. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it, 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 it's, it's a usable, space from a parking perspective and we ought to utilize that for that yep read i don't i don't disagree uh pete i don't disagree with chris a bit um i think i, I don't think we're going to land anywhere different with a with a shared parking study i think there'll still be some sharing going on here um regardless um people will find the most convenient spots but i think for visitors that aren't familiar with this site um you're gonna you're gonna want that parking close to the front door it's kind of site design 101 yeah nobody wants to walk okay so uh you're you're not in favor of a shared parking study john hemelgarn i'm not uh either dave turner no not in favor of it Paul Christensen? Definitely not in favor of it. Okay. All right. So we can move off from that. Uh, we've reached consensus. Thank you. Uh, other items that we need to talk about? I, actually, Pete, one, I do have one more question on the parking. On, Go ahead. Um, if you do do alternative fuel parking, um, I think the preference would, uh, and I don't know how we could say this, but I would much rather see it in the parking lots instead of under the building um, so that it could be used by um, tenants or guests. So I think there'll probably be a mix of, of both uh, because the tenants will want it. Right. They're, they're, so, so they want it uh, so that because they, they're living there and they're charging their vehicles for longer periods and that would then, be assumed yes yeah and, and they it, so we may end up putting like one or 
two outside yeah, that that's actually pretty. can serve two or four cars. Um, right. And then you can put the others in the garage. Um, yeah. The only problem with the ones in the garage, they won't be able to use by get guest or somebody else uh, visiting yes. them. So yes. that's why but, I prefer to see some in the parking lot. But based on you know what you're what we're all hearing about in terms of uh, electric vehicles and being sort of more mass produced, uh, you know we're assuming that that's going to be a necessary component to you know mm -hmm. occupancy. Yep. And and what's going to be really tricky is that there's probably going to be more requests for it than there is going to be service for it, and then those people are going to use those and they're going to suck up all the time in those parking spaces. When somebody it's in your else tenants with lots of electric vehicles, yes, yeah. so coming in soon. Yes, so you'll have to you'll have to find an equitable way to share those spaces. Yes, that is that is not going to be an easy discussion. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and 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 the problem is is the electric grid, right? Is as Andy mentioned, you know, we're going to have plenty of power now with this additional transformer we're putting in. But I can tell you that the more charging stations that are out there, the electrical grid is gonna need to be improved to be able to manage that because um, it sucks up a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I suggest we segue to the hack recommendations, um, which on the proposed conditions of approval, uh, are the items in condition number three, uh, A, B, C, and D. Uh, if the applicant would address those, please. Yeah, so the first one, uh, in terms of the fascia board, uh, you know, I think we could continue the white board across the white built flat portion of the building if desired. But, you know, our goal really here was to augment and highlight those, those um, differences. Differences. And if we show, if we add weight in, in cornice or some detail to the top of those roofs um, or top of those flat roofs, uh, Boy, I think it's going to highlight the flat roof, which everybody said they wanted us to focus more on the pitched roof. So I guess I'd also lean on, you know, you have a resident architect uh, on your DRB who might have a perspective on this, but, uh, <laughs> you know, my eye tends, I, I want to de-emphasize rather than emphasize the flat roof. President Architect. Uh, I'm thinking that the, the, the Chris is a is a nice poker player here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he just went he just went all in on this because my opinion now could make or break it. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. that's um, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It's you know, Chris. You know that sometimes we agree and sometimes we don't. Um, yeah. But um, th this is venturing very close, Mr. Chair into the DRB designing projects. Um, Agreed. I don't, I, as you know, I'm uncomfortable with. On the other hand, the, on the other hand, th it is something that the, the, the bylaw does say is that it wants this stronger element at the roof line. Um, I, I will start by saying that there, there that the, that this is a this is a really good solution compared to a lot of what we see in terms of breaking up a large facade, making a a large building look like it's not quite so big because of these different uh, elevations of the building. Um, I like I really think this is a it's a clever way of putting these pitch roofs on the on the building the way it, they turn and uh, go ninety degrees and then address put a gable on on both corners. Uh, or both sides of the corner. Um, I like that. I think it's getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of value out of those, those, those elements. Um, 
I like that the white portions of the building are taller than some of the others, um, than the flat roof portions. I can see the, the hacks um, concern that the, 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 the flat roof building just kind of goes up and stops and, it, and there's not a lot of definition there. Um, but again, I come from a perspective of, you know, I don't, I don't automatically say that a flat roof is a bad idea. Um, I do think that there's plenty of, of examples out there where you can, you can put at least a little bit of accentuation or, or a little bit of a heavier line at, at that spot. But I do think it wants to change when it goes from the white part of the building to the, to the brown, to the gray. Um, you know, I, Chris, you'll, you'll not be surprised that I've been sitting here sketching on, on your elevation while we've been talking. <laughs> uh, but, but it's not really my, my design. But um, I mean, you know, I wonder whether, I mean, I see this really wide band above the windows um, on the white portion of the building. But um, I think you can accentuate the fact that that building is taller than the others by if the horizontal line kind of started at the where the flat roof of the of the, the gray part was or the brown and went up and then the whatever you did and it doesn't have to be very much I think but I would I would tend to agree with the hack that the the, the bylaw says that you need to do something at the top of that flat roof building I don't think it needs to be a lot I don't think it needs to be garish um, you know I, I but um, I think you're really close. <laughs> I think they're really close to having something that would be that that's that's really quite attractive. I like the balconies. I like the pitch roofs. I like the change in materials. I like the proportions of the vertical. In that you know that each of those in each of those individual pieces is now a vertical element, and not uh, a, 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 as opposed to one big long horizontal. And I think. Um, I don't know, is there a way to make that, that grace, the gray portions with the vertical ribs, you know, a little bit lower so that you get three different heights in here? Uh, I, I'm just throwing that out. I mean, I, I, I just think, I think you could make a, a little bit of a, of a different piece to kind of give those, the tops where the flat roof meets the sky. It just wants to have something a little more, I think is what the, the bylaw is talking about. Actually, the, the dark gray one is, is taller, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Huh. Oh, I see, because it's back further. So never it's mind back. that. You've already, you've already got it. That, that's, 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 I don't mind that piece not having any, any of the cornice treatment just because it's kind of the in-between. So. OK, so really the question at hand is, is, um, is, is really was looking for you John as the person most qualified to make a statement as mm -hmm. to whether or not um, 3A should remain as a condition of approval. That was really where we were going. I know, and, and I couldn't and, help. And, uh, and you answered it that yes, it should. And Chris, I think you understand now, you have guidance from us that, because uh, we're all gonna defer to John, because. <laughs> you guys no, he is he is the most qualified here, and uh, and so um, you you now have guidance that that we we are looking for something, but not something of great mass. So I just want to clarify what I heard is that on the white portion we continue with some component, but that on the lower gray. Um, as shown on the um, current rendering in the staff notes, that the gray line above, are we also adding a cornice or cap to that? Because there is a cap piece, it's just not, it's not proud of the wall. And I guess I just want to understand what the, and I know you're not designing, but. I know I, it, it's really hard. I mean, I'd love to have sit down and have lunch with you and just kind of <laughs> talk with your designer because it, it, it'd be fun. But um, I, I think that it, it just wants to be something that's a, that's a, a little bit wider of a horizontal band that, that you see 
on the rest of the building to kind of say, you know, this is where your the motion of, of your eyeball stops right there, and it, it creates an edge. Um, it doesn't kind of slide off into the into the into the sky beyond. Um, it, it, it's. It, I, I mean, I don't think it needs to be more than a a, a foot high. Yeah. Um, and and again, if you could make the band that's on the white portion a different elevation than what's on the, you know, so that 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 you know that they, they don't overlap, right? So that the white piece is up higher. Maybe it's a little thicker, so it's a little more pronounced on the white portion of the building. Um, you know. That's, I keep thinking back to all the row houses that I looked at over and over again in school in Cincinnati. And <laughs> they just, you know, there's a cornice at the top of all those flat roof buildings. And, you know, they, they just, they all start to look alike eventually, but, it, it, but they all serve the same purpose, which is to actually end the building at the top. And that's, that's what the, the, the bylaw is looking to do. They're not trying to make it the nicest piece or the fanciest piece, but they're just trying to make it so that a building has a, a top, a middle, and a bottom. And uh, you know, it's interesting that the hack doesn't focus more on on the base component here. But um, okay. So uh, again, I think you're really, really close on this. I don't think it's a lot um, there. Okay. So hack um, hack item B. Uh, variety, a variety of shrubs and perennials. Um, I'm assuming Chris and Andy, you have no issue with that. Correct. Okay. Uh, C, enhance the corner with benches and landscaping. Um, no so objection. Can I, uh, so can we go back to B? Here, here's a question that I have. Now all of a sudden, you know, we've got these other apartment buildings within the neighborhood, and we've got a, a pedestrian feel that we've already sort of created. And now all of a sudden we're gonna have this different build, we're gonna have another building with a different feel to it. And are we um uh, you know, we don't have consistency. And is that okay? Um, or, Fine. you know, by adding more planting beds and shrubbery along there, does it, you know, I don't know. I just was wondering if it, it's, it just feels a little bit odd. Like all of a sudden now we're doing more landscaping in between the building and the, and the sidewalks versus lawn or something like that. I don't know. That's just me. No, I, I, I'm glad. I'm I'm glad you went back to that, Chris. I was I was actually surprised that you didn't push back right away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the I guess my question is for staff, and that this is the that this kind of builds on what Chris was saying, and that it's not consistent necessarily. I'm wondering where in the where in the bylaws it talks about the the fact that the that the that we sh we have the authority to require additional planting along the street trees or with the street trees. Yes, uh, so chapter 23 landscaping has type three informal plantings and type four formal planting buffers, um, which the informal plantings can be used in many circumstances. And then the formal plantings buffer is most appropriate along public ways. So, um, this it includes a ground cover of turf and major trees. It may also include ornamental trees, shrubs, flowers, and planters. Um, sorry, did you guys hear me okay with the mask? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the minimum density per 100 feet shall be a full ground cover of turf and three major trees. So but there's the, there's the tree, street tree standard, and then there's um, enhancing that with the landscape buffers along public ways um, beyond one tree every 40 feet to include some planting trees and, bug, and shrubs. I don't think it needs to be every single one of these spots that are highlighted in the photo. Um, it could be 
only a couple of them, uh, but just to provide additional plantings. So wh why doesn't this conversation come up every time we require street trees? That's what I don't understand is that, uh, the, you know, the, I'm not sure that there is a, the, the, the buffers don't, don't apply it along the street, along Overflight. the public street. That's what I'm not understanding is, is why, why this is even coming up. It's probably been an oversight on all the other hearings we've had. Well, I, I disagree. Um, yeah, I've worked in the town for 20 years. And if we provided the street trees along a public road, that was what the requirement was. Uh, landscaping was required around a specific building. And that's what we've shown on our plans, but not necessarily in between, within the right of way or on the edge of the right of way. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing that it's not consistent with what we've done through the rest of the place. I mean, as people walk, you want them to be able to see and feel different things. So, you know, some plantings and stuff in that in, in areas like that would be beneficial, I think. Maybe not like that, like they have there with every what everyone filled in, but I would think some of them could be uh, filled in with plants. You know, I think if we wanted to you know, highlight an entrance or an extra exit point, you know, where the walkway is, you know, that would be an area that I think that we could, you know, say, hey, here you go, here's an entry point and here's a connection. We have that both on uh, Holland Lane and on Market. And, you know, so we could certainly do that. Um, and that to me kind of makes sense to say, hey, here you go, this is where we're coming in. Right. Um, so those, those sorts of things, um, I would agree, we could certainly augment to there. If that's an easier, if, if there's a rationale for why we're doing plantings, rather than us just picking some random spot to put some bushes and some perennials, uh, it's like an entry point it's the corner, you know, we could highlight those three, you know, focus on those, those areas. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on from that. I, I, I hear you. We will, we'll have a discussion about that, Chris. Um, C. Uh, enhance Holland Lane Market Street corner with benches and landscaping. Uh, consider moving the utility box. So you you had already mentioned that you were going to going to move the location of the utility box. Uh, what's your position on the uh, on the benches? So I'm I I think we're fine adding benches at that uh, at that corner. Uh, maybe there's two benches that we add. Uh, and one on each, uh, one on the Holland side and one on the Market Street side. And then it sort of goes along with what we were just talking about in highlighting, you know, maybe some landscaping on that corner. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then the uh, last hack recommendation D, provide more benches along backyard area pathways. That's, I mean, I think, I think that's, we can add, certainly add a, a, I think we have two bench areas right now. We do have a large patio area as well. So, you know, that's going to get used. There's going to be some tables out there. Um, you know, we certainly can put a couple of more. If we said that we were going to add two more benches out into the, that area, I think that would be fair. Okay. Uh, other questions. That concludes the hack recommendations. Other questions by the DRB. Pete, there was a question. That I think it came up at one point about some additional trash cans. Yes. Um, along the street. Um, 
I would ask Chris and Andy, um, are the, are, I believe there are a few trash cans along the streets now that you've put into Finney Crossing already. Is yes. that right? Do those get used? Um, or do they get abused? I, uh, abused. I don't actually know. I haven't heard a complaint about it, which means that I don't, it's not good or bad. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, I would worry if we put, start to put too many of them, that people are going to start bringing their trash and, and dumping them in there and using it as a free place to get rid of their garbage. Uh, so I think what's happening is we do have dog trash uh, that gets in there, you know, uh, but I, so if we don't have, you know, so you have that. And then the other piece is um, we have, uh, you know, it's, it's been a little bit more of an active construction site in some, <laughs> in a lot of ways. And there's pretty easy ways for people to get rid of their trash right now. If they want to come to the neighborhood, they just, <laughs> they just go to the dumpster and throw it in there. Uh, so I think as we get rid of some of that construction, debris uh you know collection systems you know we'll find that that may be more of an issue hmm. all right so we certainly can add another trash can or two i mean we're already maintaining them now mm -hmm. yeah okay all right thank you is there is there a, a condition bad trash receptacles, or is that just been a narrative to consider? Number 15? Uh, yes, Mission 15 has been drafted. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Um, I just have one around the concrete foundation. Uh, I read in there that uh, no more than a foot of it would be showing around the building because uh, uh, one of the, one of the, um, guys was uh, either stone uh, on that concrete so that it, we just didn't see bare concrete. And when I look at some of the perspectives, it looks like some of the places are, you know, it's hard to say because it's not drawn to scale, but it looks like, you know, there's two or three feet of concrete showing around the building in places. Yeah, so we understand that we're gonna try to hide that and we're gonna add some fill and some, modify some grade changes to, you know, try to get within that uh, foot. I mean, I'd love to have, say that it was 18 inches. Uh, you know, we have to have a minimum of eight inches from the top of foundation wall to grade. So it only gives us four inches, which is like not much uh, for slopes. And uh, so I guess our perspective is, hey, if we could get 18 inches approved, that would be better than a foot. Um, but that we realize that we're going to have to bring in fill and material to get it up higher or add stone or add stone in certain places to get it down lower mm -hmm. okay other questions Actually, I have one more looking at the base drawing. I'm, I'm going to feel like Dave Saladino now. I'm going to get one more. <laughs> um, when I look at the base drawing, the, the basement drawing, and I know this is probably uh, something that's not a really big deal, but uh, I was, is there just one elevator group in the building? No, there's two. There's, at least. Two. there's two elevators, but they are grouped together. So they are in the center of the building, in the in the L-shaped portion of it. Um, but there are two elevators in there, two full-size elevators. So how far roughly is it from like parking space 33 to the elevator for an elderly person? It's like uh, 200 and some odd feet. Yeah. Feet. So that's all done by Joe. Uh, by code, Dave. Yeah, no, I, I realize that. I was just asking the question because it, it yeah. uh, seems to stood out. It, it seems like I recall one of the ones we did, the fire department was uh, concerned about that, but since they've reviewed it already, I'm sure there's no concern. 
but it, yeah, no, I just wasn't sure. They, they did look at that. We did talk to them about that. And I think uh, everybody was in agreement doing the dual elevator was an overwhelming better scenario than just having a single elevator, which is technically allowed. A single elevator could service this building. Um, but we did add the second as a safety mechanism. Okay. Okay, other questions? Okay, members of the public, either present in the room or participating by Zoom, any questions? If you do, please raise your hand. Or uh, we've got no members of the public on Zoom. I'm sorry. There's no members of the public on Zoom. There's no members of the public, public uh, on Zoom. So on Zoom. Okay. So you hear? Go right. That would be a no. That's great. Okay. Um, any final remarks, questions? Andy, Chris, ERB members. Yeah. Again, just thank you for your time. Appreciate your consideration. As I have said, you know, we do get better projects going through these. Uh, and uh, uh, so appreciate your time. Okay, I'm gonna close, uh, close the hearing. DP 09-01.24 at 912. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go into deliberative session now. Uh, Andy, take your time. Don't uh, don't rush to pull your stuff together. You're you're fine. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back to the Town of Williston Development Review Board for Tuesday, December fourteenth, twenty twenty one. Uh, we are out of deliberative session. Uh, is there a motion for DP 22-03? Yes, if, if Simon can actually put it up for me to read from there, because I didn't mark them up on mine, thinking <laughs> we were going to have them again. Okay, as authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, David Turner, moved at the Williston Development Review Board having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application, application by the Williston Development Bylaw and having early, <laughs> heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of December 14, 2021, accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law for DP 22-03 and approve, approve this discretionary permit subject to the conditions of approval above. Um, and we had a couple changes. Uh, number two, we'll change it to read the subject property is non-conforming with respect to the landscape buffer requirements under WDB chapter 23. Uh, the correction of this non-conforming is not reasonably proportional to the scale of the proposed development. We'll change number so, three. So Dave, Dave uh, please clarify that that's item number two under condition under conclusions of law. Oh yes. So so the change will be to item number two under conclusions of law, and I'll re I'll read it again. The subject property is non-conforming with respect to the landscape buffer requirements under WDB Chapter Twenty Three. The correction of the non-conformity is not reasonably proportional to the scale of the proposed development. And then under conclusions of law number three, we'll read, the subject property is non-conforming with respect to the street trees requirements under WDB chapter 26. The correction of this non-conformity is reasonably proportioned to the scale of the proposed development. And then we will change number seven under is that the condition? Yes. Yeah. Number seven under conditions of approval um, will read uh, street trees on Avenue B shall be brought into compliance with the standards of WB, WDB chapter 23 and 26. 
Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Paul. Any discussion? Nope. No. Uh, please uh, indicate yay or nay, please. Paul. Yay. John. Yay. Chair is a yay. Dave Turner. Yay. Uh, four in favor, none opposed. Motion carries. Is there a motion for DP 09 24 <laughs> Yes. Um, as authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, John Hemmelgarn, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of, um, that date is not correct, is it? It's a public hearing of December 14th, 14th 2021. Accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law for DP 09-01.24 and approve this discretionary permit subject to the conditions of approval above. This approval authorizes the applicant to file final plans, obtain approval of these plans from staff, and then seek an administrative permit for the proposed development, which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. We are going to um, modify a couple of conditions here of approval, specifically number 3B is going to read, consider providing a variety of shrubs and perennial planting beds between the street trees along Holland Lane and Market Street at building entrances and or focal points to enhance the pedestrian experience along the sidewalks and break up the long green strip. We'll also modify 3D to read, provide a minimum of two more benches along backyard area pathways set to the side of the main sidewalk. Clustered seating, benches and pairs facing each other is encouraged. We're also gonna modify uh, condition number 15 to read final plans must specify snow storage, trash and recycling bins for litter collection. This shall include at least one additional trash and recycling bin at the Zephyr Road Market Street intersection. And then we're going to add three additional conditions. Number 22, the curb cut onto Market Street shall align with the Union Bank curb cut across Market Street. Number 23, the crosswalks on Market Street shall align with the sidewalks from the building exits. And number 24, the DRB recommends that some alternative fuel slash EV charge spaces be publicly accessible for visitors in the surface parking lot, recognizing this is not a requirement of 14.2.4.3 of the Wilson Development Bylaw. Thank you, John. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Dave. Any discussion? Nope. Uh, yay or nay? Paul? Yay. John Hamilgarn? Yay. Uh, the chair is a yay. Dave Turner? Yay. Uh, four in favor, none opposed. Motion carries. Uh, is there any other business to bring forth before we adjourn? Nope. Actually, I do have one question of concern. What? Uh, oh, are, is the video froze? Doesn't look like it's working. No, we're all listening intently to you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Pete was froze on my screen. That's what was going on. I was like, <laughs> um, so I have a, a, a question around signage on residential property. It's kind of other business, I guess, but it's And, and where I'm coming from here, I could, actually, you know, I, I'm going to drop it. I'll just take it off record later. I don't want it to be on record. Okay. Uh, anything else? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your service. Have a great holiday.
You too. Thank you, Pete. Next year.